The Problematic Prince A beautiful lady, like an ethereal fairy who lost her way on the mortal world, was standing idly in the middle of the exhibition room. Breathtaking pieces of art adorned her surroundings, but the lady's gaze was only on her hands that were clasped together. The eyes of the guests, who pretended to appreciate the paintings while secretly glancing at her, contained contemptuous curiosity that could not be hidden. Pavel, who just entered the hall, ended up stopping on his tracks when she saw the beautiful lady. He felt a strange sense of deja vu and couldn't help but feel that she was someone familiar. A familiar long brunette hair, petite body, pale white skin, and clear blue eyes. Ona? Even when he carefully called out a certain name that was dear to him, Pavel wasn't ready to be convinced. In the end, the surprise he felt at the moment he made eye contact with the familiar lady who raised her head was even greater. Pavel. A bright smile appeared on Erna's face as she looked at him incredulously. In an instant, the attention of every guest focused on them, but she did not seem to be conscious of it. He quickly asked for permission from the confused director of the art center, then hurriedly approached Erna and respectfully greeted her with courtesy befitting a young lady from a noble family. It's been a while, Ms. Hardy. Pavel sent a secret glance towards Erna, who had a puzzled expression on her face. There were currently too many eyes around them, there was no need to throw out further information about their relationship in this place. Shu, to Erna, who was about to ask a question, he gave a short and decisive warning. She looked at him with narrowed eyes and belatedly nodded with a small sigh after a while. Everyone's attention in this exhibition room was still focused on the two of them. Ah, yes, it's been a while indeed, Mr. Lore. She sympathized with Pavel with her awkward acting. However, even at this awkward moment, his eyes were still full of joy that could not be hidden. I guess Pavel did the right thing. The obvious happiness that she and her friend shared from their unexpected reunion erased the displeasure in her heart that was left behind by that evil prince. All that's left now is Pavel and the joy of finally seeing an old friend after a long time. The relief and comfort that she felt after meeting her only friend made Erna suddenly realize the loneliness and apprehension she harbored ever since she came to the city. It was nice to see you. I'll see you again. Before turning around, Pavel quickly whispered a word of encouragement to her. I'll contact you. He quickly added with a bright smile. It was the smile of her friend, Pavel Lor, that she remembered dearly. She pursed her lips to avoid carelessly uttering words that could be taken out of context and responded with a small nod of her head instead. After sending a short smile once more, he returned to the elderly gentleman who was waiting for him. She later remembered that the man was the director of the Art Institute who gave the speech at the opening ceremony. His face, which introduced Pavel to the nobility, showed a pride for his student that could not be hidden. With a smile, Erna quietly left the exhibition room. She admitted she was sad that their reunion was cut short, but she still thinks it was a good thing they met, especially when she remembered the promise that Pavel left behind. They will soon meet again, and there were many things that she wanted to say and share to her dear friend. With an upright posture that reflects her current joyful mood, she began to leave the exhibition room with a much lighter step. The regular sound of footsteps resounded through the hallway, which was lit by the languid sunlight. She made her way towards the stairs. However, this blissful moment ended abruptly when the memories of His Highness came to her mind like a raging flood. His golden hair that resembled the afternoon sunlight and subtle gray eyes suddenly came to her mind. During that unforgettable moment when he kissed the back of her hand, the man's gray eyes gazed directly at her. In the end, he insulted her with such an elegant and polite gesture, and without any remorse, she treated her as a substitute for the princess. Erna, 
with a frown on her forehead, wiped the back of her hand where the prince's lips had touched, as if erasing that memory. Even though she was wearing gloves, the strange and unpleasant sensation of his lips touching her hand remained on her mind. In the end, she even used a handkerchief to scrub the back of her hand thoroughly. It was just a simple gesture, but her cheeks couldn't stop burning from shame and anger. If only she could, she would have completely wiped away those unpleasant memories from her head. If it wasn't for this stupid handkerchief, resentment for the handkerchief that was returned by the prince surged inside her chest, but it didn't last long since it was a gift from her grandmother on her birthday last year. In consideration to the sincerity of her grandmother who embroidered the flowers and initials of her name, she couldn't truly hate this handkerchief in the end, even when that cursed prince touched it. Days had passed after the art exhibit ended, but the shameful memories that the prince left behind came frequently and tormented Erna. It always appeared on her mind without regard to the situation. When the sun was shining, when she saw her face in the mirror, or even when she sneezed just like now. Ah! She let out a light sigh as she looked down at the ink stains made by the pen she had dropped. Lisa, who witnessed what happened, got up and opened the window of the bedroom. As the gentle summer night's wind blew, the thick scent of flowers that filled the room was lessened to an extent. Oh my, how absurd this is. Those noblemen must have picked up all the flowers in Schuber and gave all of them to my lady. Lisa clicked her tongue and looked at the amazing scenery of her lady's bedroom. Various bouquets of flowers with letters of courtship were everywhere, mostly because her weak-minded lady couldn't afford to throw away those innocent flowers. Additionally, Lady Erna made an effort to send replies of refusal to every pathetic letter. This was the reason why her master, who would always go to bed early unless she was dragged to attend a party, was often awake until late at night these past days. I will write a new one. Erna removed the stained letter and set it down on the reading table. Lisa, who watched the young lady write a sincere reply of refusal again and again, let out another deep sigh. Aren't these prodigal sons illiterate? Why are they so tenacious and persistent even after being rejected? Lisa openly grumbled with an upset mood. Erna, on the other hand, carefully pressed down the written letter using a blotter paper with a small smile on her face. It seemed that Lady Erna was the only woman under the sky of Lechen who would make such an effort to carefully write a rejection letter. She tried to persuade her that it was not necessary, but the young lady stubbornly insisted. Even if you rejected their courtship, a proper lady still needs to do so with dignity and courtesy befitting a true noble. Erna spoke such words like an old woman who was from the last century. Lisa found such Lady Erna quite lovely at these times, but she couldn't help but also find her stubbornness frustrating, which further made her poor self upset. That is the last one for today. When Erna picked up a new set of stationery, Lisa finally declared with a smirk. Is it going to be a big deal if those stubborn fools got the replies a bit late? It is already the time for you to take a rest, Mississippi. While her lady hesitated, Lisa quickly put away the stationery and inkwell. Did you have any other letters? Other letters? Oh, you mean from Mr. Pavelor? Lisa, who had been listening to the same question for several days, understood Erna's meaning at once. I'm afraid there's still nothing, Mississippi, seeing you waiting like this. It must be a very important letter, right? Not really. It's not like that. Erna smiled awkwardly and shook her head. Fortunately, Lisa didn't ask any further questions. It's already been four days. Did something happen to Pavel? Erna, who had been anxiously wandering around the room, did not get in bed until midnight. As she gazed at the curtains swaying in the night breeze that blew through the slightly opened window accompanied by the strong scent of flowers, she finally gradually felt sleepy. She fell asleep while stroking the back of her hand 
as if trying to soothe her troubled heart. A lively bachelor party at a noble's club ended naturally, as the participants lost their consciousness one by one due to too much alcohol. Even the main character of the party, who was struggling to keep himself upright, ended up collapsing on the table. In the end, only Bjorn was left. Hey, groom. With the hand that just put down a glass of wine, Bjorn hit the forehead of the groom. The force of his hit rang out quite loudly, but the victim still showed no sign of waking up. I won. I don't know. Just take it. The drunk groom mumbled in an indistinct voice. Bjorn groaned and got up. He wasn't in good shape because he was also quite drunk, but it wasn't enough for him to join the ugly crowd that was scattered around. With his dry mouth moistened with cold water, he picked up his loot lying in the center of the table and turned around. It was the tradition at every bachelor party called Stag Night. The last conscious survivor would receive a golden trophy in the shape of an antler. Bjorn couldn't remember how many stag antlers he now had in his home. The funny thing was that he even got the trophy at his own bachelor party. He wanted to throw it away because it was a very unfortunate trophy, but it was a piece meticulously made by a skilled craftsman from the same workshop. So it was such a waste to throw it away. Thanks to that, the antlers that survived till this day must have been buried somewhere as a decoration in the Schuber Palace. He staggered as he left the club full of ugly guests that were either weeping out of the blue or toppling down over and over again. He could have ordered a carriage to bring him home, but it was still too early for the coachman to drive the carriage when Dawn hadn't even arrived yet. Erna, who fell asleep only late at night, woke up much earlier than usual because of a nightmare that haunted her dreams. She couldn't remember what the dream was about when she woke up, but the memory of being chased by something and the fear she felt still remained clear in her heart. In the end, she quickly got up and sat on her bed. Turning the lamp on the bedside table, the warm light diluted the darkness helping her see the table clock that showed that it was still less than four o'clock. Staring blankly at nothing for a while, Erna gave up on going back to sleep and decided to get out of bed. After getting dressed and tidying up the bed, the dawn began to arrive gradually. Erna stood in front of the window for quite some time and turned around as if trying to control her weakening heart. Suddenly, the thought of going for a walk appeared on her mind as the pale morning light seeped through the gaps in the curtains. Finally deciding on what she wanted to do, she began to move diligently. She braided her long hair, put on a bonnet, and brought out her gloves. Staring at the gloves on her hand, the memory of a certain prince who had done a terrible thing to her most cherished gloves appeared in her mind, making her feel resentful once again. With her hand that was clad in unadorned gloves, she habitually rubbed the back of her hand. Erna, who finally finished her preparations after attaching a large flower pinned to her shawl, sneaked out of the bedroom quietly. The Viscount said it would be unwise for a noble lady to walk outside the house without a maid, but she felt that it was still too early to wake Lisa up. She had already mastered the geography of this area after staying here for so long, she believed that she could now take a walk by herself. Successfully escaping from the hardy mansion without waking anyone up, Erna looked up at the starry morning sky while catching her breath. The street was still dark, but not as scary as she thought, and she even felt more comfortable now than in the middle of the day which was full of passersby. Additionally, she had more freedom to see her surroundings because there were no gazes staring at her. With thoughts of sending a letter to Pavel, she slowly started walking down through Terra Avenue. There was an address written in his letter that she had brought from Buford, so she thought that it would be okay to visit him in person. Wouldn't that get Pavel in trouble? When she remembered her only friend, who kept his distance while being conscious of people's gaze for her sake, her troubled heart felt relieved somehow. 
It was then that she suddenly became aware of a bum lying down the street. Erna, who had unintentionally turned her gaze toward the clock tower, let out a small scream. In the distance, she could see a man lying on the railing of the large fountain at the center of the square. She looked around the empty square and began to approach the fountain cautiously. She could now see him better with their distance shortened. He was a tall man with a head full of blonde hair with his arms mostly covering his face, which made her unable to completely see his features. Additionally, she could see a strange-looking golden object rolling around at his feet. Hey, are you okay? Can you hear me? Standing a step away from the man, she asked nervously. The man, however, didn't even move. Are you sick? Are you hurt? Should I call the police? When she finally took the one last step towards him, the man lowered the arm that was covering his face. Fortunately, he didn't seem to be dead, making Erna sigh from relief. However, she quickly regretted her choice which was swept away by unnecessary worries and sympathy when she met the man's gaze that was now staring at her. The unconscious vagrant lying down was the very man he never wanted to meet, Prince Bjorn. Erna hurriedly backed away, but Bjorn's movements of grabbing her wrist were a little faster as usual. Erna Hardy? He sighed and slowly called her name. Only then did she understand why the prince was lying in the square like this. A strong smell of alcohol that could give her a headache was wafting from his body. Just smelling it was enough to make her intoxicated. Why is Miss Hardy here? He asked, groaning while still holding Erna's wrist. Put my hand down, or else I will scream. I asked you why you are here. As she struggled to pull her wrist out, his grip only grew stronger. This is the square, not the prince's estate. I could go anywhere I want. I guess that makes sense. He nodded while slowly getting up to sit down on the ledge of the fountain. When he saw her bright red face standing in front of him, he unexpectedly burst out laughing. The stars shone above his head when his consciousness clouded, and now Erna Hardy was here in front of him. For a while, he thought that he was just hallucinating. With the time so early that the sun was still rising up and in a place outside like here, it was impossible to meet Lady Hardy. However, the Erna in front of him was definitely the real Erna, and he suddenly felt the situation unbearably funny. Let me go. As he struggled to regain consciousness, she roared once more. If you need help, I will call someone. So please, let go of my hand. Hey, Miss Hardy, do you really want to sell yourself to me? Bjorn, who was exhaling slowly with his head bowed down, asked in a low-pitched voice. I beg your pardon? Erna, who had been fussing while waving her arms, became calm at the moment she heard his question. If you want to make a deal with me, you have to bargain first, you know. How much? His gray eyes, that were unusually clear despite him being drunk, gleamed in the faintly bright dawn light. I understand this conversation is just plain rude and unpleasant. Please let me go now. Let. Me. Go. She couldn't speak properly and only let out a moan-like sigh. Tell me how much it is. With his eyes closed, he softly asked. For the first time, she realized that all senses could be paralyzed due to too much anger thanks to the prince's insults. She should have poured out some curse words, but no voice came out of her throat as her mind went blank and the pain in her wrist slowly faded away. I don't want to have this insulting conversation with you anymore. Please stop. Erna barely managed to speak after a while. Bjorn, who was gazing at the distant sky, slowly lowered his gaze and met with her gaze once again. His eyes held an indifferent look. So, what if you don't like my words? You should know when enough is enough. Aren't you being too rude? She screamed in a rage. So, you're telling me you know how not to cross the line? He calmly asked her with his lips in an obvious smirk. 
For a moment, the words she wanted to say got stuck at her throat, making her unable to answer his question. How could such a messy prodigal son become the crown prince of this country at one point? She was shocked by that fact to the point of making her dizzy. Meanwhile, Bjorn, who wanted to say something again, slowly closed his eyes. When Erna felt something strange, it was only after his already staggering body had tilted sideways. Surprised by the sudden turn of events, she instinctively supported him, but it was impossible for her to endure the large frame of a drunken man with her petite body. Their bodies were tangled together and rolled on the floor of the square at the same time. Half conscious due to the fall, Erna realized that she was now lying on the cold stone floor only after the bright dawn sky came into her eyes. Additionally, the cursed prince was lying on top of her. The breath he exhaled tickled her neck and his tight body was very hot and rigid, making her feel threatened. Sadash, please save me. Help me. Barely coming to her senses, she screamed with all her might and started to struggle. However, no matter how much he pushed, the unconscious Grand Duke wouldn't even budge just a bit. Suddenly, the sound of footsteps approaching from afar could be heard. Go away. Let go. Erna slapped the prince's shoulder and back with her clenched fist but Bjorn, who wanted to open his eyes for a moment, lowered his head once again. Even in the midst of this unfortunate incident, the prince did not let go of her wrist and as his hot, soft lips brushed the nape of her neck, her face crumpled slowly as if she was going to burst into tears soon. Meanwhile, the footsteps of the approaching people became more and more clear. Let go of me. Please let go. Her desperate movements pushed the hem of the dress up to her knees, but she didn't have the energy to worry about it for now. She turned her head in fear, trying to find anything to help her out of this predicament. Picking up the golden object that had fallen near was an instinctive choice, as there was no rational judgment left in her head other than the desperate feeling that she had to do something. Help me. She struggled as she swung the trophy she was now holding. With a scream that grew sharper, Erna started slamming Bjorn's back with the trophy without mercy. At the same time that Bjorn opened his eyes to the pain that had grown to overcome his drunkenness, the sound of footsteps from those who approached where they were suddenly stopped. Your Highness, surprised by the absurd sight, the Grand Duke's driver and attendant shouted. With a frown on his face, the Grand Duke let out a groan and turned around. As he flopped down on the ground, Erna could finally stand up while tightly holding his trophy she used to beat him in her hand. Seeing her current state with barely focused eyes, a new smile spilled from Bjorn's lips. Erna, who refused the help of the attendant, took a breath and stepped back. Tears seemed to fill her eyes, but she did not cry since crying was something she was fed up with. Instead, she shot a gaze filled with hatred back at him. While the coachman and the attendant raised his tired body upright, Erna quickly turned around and started to run away from him once again. The sound of her heels from her frantic running echoed throughout the stillness of dawn. That's a, are you okay, your highness? The attendant, who was looking at him with a strange gaze, asked stammeringly. Bjorn, however, closed his eyes slowly without answering. When he opened his eyes again, Erna had already gone to the other side of the square. The ribbon tied to the end of her braided hair fluttered as if it was a pair of wings trying to lift her petite body. The last thing he saw before losing consciousness again was the golden antler still in Erna Hardy's grasp. His bounty gleamed beautifully in the bright morning sun. Pavel's letter, which Erna had been looking forward to for the past days, finally arrived on the third day of her long wait. Thankfully, Viscount Hardy and his wife were currently not in the mansion. Erna, who was sitting in front of the desk obviously distracted, stood up in shock by the sudden noise of her door opening. 
The artificial rose, which she had been holding on to since morning, was still left unfinished. It wasn't like her, who had already committed the procedure of making flowers by heart that she could do it with her eyes closed, to be unable to finish even a single flower. The letter you have been waiting for has finally arrived. It's a letter from Mr. Pavelor. At the moment she heard her maid's words, Erna immediately regained her bright smile. You have to reply now, Mississippi. At Lisa's urging, her eyes widened. Right now? Yes. The messenger who brought this letter is waiting in the backyard. He relayed that Mr. Lore wanted to get a reply from you right away. Troubled by her maid's unexpected words, Erna looked at the letter in her hand once again, which contained an invitation from Pavel to take a walk along the riverside together this evening. She quickly sat down at her desk and decided to write down her reply. In a rush, a few drops of ink ended up dripping in the paper, but there was no time for her to get a new clean paper and write her reply from the start again. Soon, Lisa received a letter in which the wax had not yet hardened, but now was not the time to dilly-dally as she left the bedroom in a hurry. After the sound of her footsteps drifted away across the hallway, Erna finally let out a breath she didn't realize she had held back. I will finally meet Pavel this evening. As soon as she thought of finally meeting up with her only friend, a feeling of unfairness and dismay came crashing down in her heart. She couldn't openly tell anyone what happened between her and the prince, even Pavel. It was because what happened was so absurd, she was afraid that if just a small part of the whole situation came about might cause a misunderstanding right away. Not only did he hold her wrist, her petite body even ended up getting trapped under the body of the man she detested. What was even worse was that his lips touched the nape of her neck during the traumatic event. Such an immoral thing would have made her grandma faint in shock if she ever knew of what had happened. Erna once again touched the nape of her neck, which now had red marks from her rubbing it habitually for the past days. The more she tried to erase that cursed memory, the clearer she remembered the events that had transpired yesterday. His irregular breathing, the feeling of his hot and moist breath against her skin, and the weight of his large and firm body that made her feel intimidated. She could recall all of these as clearly as if she was experiencing them now. He's a poisonous mushroom. Recalling Lisa's warning, she breathed out a small sigh of annoyance. Pretty and colorful poisonous mushrooms, she would often see them while taking in the forest of Buford, and now, their images were superimposed on that ugly man's face. I guess he is indeed a poisonous mushroom. As if erasing the memory of a certain huge poisonous mushroom, Erna tightly closed her eyes. I hope dinner will arrive soon. Let's meet Pavel so I can finally open up my troubled heart and feel refreshed. Isn't it better to call the attending physician? The butler's gaze, which was examining Bjorn's naked back, clearly showed deep concern. I end the last three days after the incident, the Grand Duke wore his shirt casually. Every time he locked a button, a small sigh accompanied by a smirk would appear on his face. He had the same reaction just like the moment he had first seen his bruised back after he recovered from his drunken state. The memory of the incident remained hazy, but he must have been hit very hard for him to have received such injuries. For the first time in his life, he was beaten to the point of bruising and for him, such a rare occasion was certainly quite monumental. And they said she looked harmless like a little deer? As various praises for Erna's prowess came to his mind, laughter escaped from Bjorn's lips and he slowly began to laugh aloud. The fact that he was the only one who knew the reality of how beastly she could be once cornered suddenly made him feel regretful. I guess she is not only a beast, but also a thief. And a very robust thief at that. He fastened the last button on his shirt while recalling his golden trophy gleaming beautifully while being held in her hands. 
Butler Gregg, who stood beside him, handed over the tie he was holding on the tray with an agile motion, without any wasted movement. If you find bringing the doctor is burdensome, then at least a treatment. It's okay. It's not such a big deal. I've only been hit this much. Are you really all right? Who dares to do such a thing, your highness? Greg's eyes widened in disbelief as if they were about to pop out. I have a pet, you see. Bjorn casually picked up the jacket. And it's such a vicious beast too. He continued with a bright smile as he wore his jacket, then walked out of the dressing room with wide and energetic steps. Mrs. Fitz approached quickly as if waiting for him. I heard that you got hurt. I'm okay. He reassured her with the same smile he had given to the other servants. Mrs. Fitz, on the other hand, had a butler-like expression on her face as she expressed her fuss and concern. If my life was really in danger, the first thing I would do is to ask our Mrs. Fitz for help. Your Highness, even when the stoic head maid stood in front of him with a strict expression on her face, he just continued to smirk without raising an eyebrow. In the end, Mrs. Fitz could only sigh and decided to step back. She knew from her many years of experience that any further nagging would only be meaningless. Clearing out her exasperated expression, and she continued report the various work of the Grand Duke that needed to be dealt with within today. And finally, I think you should reply to the invitation from Harbor ST. Mrs. Fitz, who had always maintained her composure, added in a perplexed tone. The Grand Duke raised his narrowed eyes to meet her gaze. Harbor ST, do you mean my great aunt? Yes, your highness. The party hosted by Martianus Harbor will be held in two days. I think you will have to decide whether or not to attend by today at the latest. All right, the season has come for my aunt to show off her personal connections. He nodded in understanding and picked up the papers lying on the desk. The party of Martianus Harbor, who boasts a wide network, was very famous among the nobles for its grand scale. It would not be an exaggeration to say that it was a place where all two-legged socialites gather. Then I will send a letter to reject their invitation. I'm afraid that couldn't be done. Bjorn, who had been scanning the report on his last investment case, raised his head once again when he heard her rebuttal. Sure, I will participate then. Mrs. Fitz's eyes widened in surprise at his unexpected answer that came out of nowhere. But Prince, as you know, Martianus Harbor. I know, Princess Gladys must have received an invitation to a raucous party with various infamous individuals and the assorted events that would result from it were the greatest pleasures of old age for Martianus Harbor. There was no way she could miss the former crown prince and his ex-wife, who were the most important and prominent interest in the social circle. Furthermore, he bet that Erna Hardy would be there too. That old woman would be sad if the second most prominent figure in today's social circle would not attend her beloved party. If I have to say one thing, there are many mouths out there who want to speak maliciously about Princess Gladys and your highness. Mrs. Fitz reminded with a worried expression on her face. Everyone is looking forward to it. Can I do at least one good thing for their enthusiasm? He nodded casually as he opened the lid of the fountain pen placed on the pen tray. I'm going to give my aunt and grandmother great pleasure for the rest of their lives. Ah, uh, of course, since they already have a chronic disease, I have to provide them entertainment that wouldn't put too much strain in their heart. You Highness, I guess even if Martianus Harbor suddenly dies and goes to hell, she will have a party with Satan in the end, won't she? Either way, it would still be hell even for the Martianus. My aunt and grandmother cannot live in heaven. A hell full of troublesome bastards is indeed a paradise for them, to be honest. Bjorn smiled as he signed the bottom of the report in his hands. The numbers on the papers were satisfactory, and so was the party of his aunt and grandmother, who would provide him an easy way to catch a sneaky thief. 
I will do as you command. Exasperated with his antics, Mrs. Fitz could only obey his order. Bjorn reminisced about his debt relationship with a certain lady. In the end, he could only take it slowly as he decided which method would give him the most satisfactory result. Pavel arrived at the Grand Duke's bridge earlier than the promised time. Situated on the lower reaches of the Arbit River, this bridge was famous for its golden statues adorning the railings and the delicate and colorful street lamps. It was built to commemorate the victory of Philip II, so it was given the same name. However, most people just called it the Grand Duke's Bridge for the simple reason that it was the bridge that connected the city center to the Schuber Palace, which was the residence of the Grand Duke. Pavel leaned against the railing and looked at the other side of the road, where Erna would soon appear. Except for events at the Schuber Palace, the road was mostly empty because the area was sparsely populated. That was the main reason why he chose this place as the meeting place. It was about a week before the opening ceremony of the art exhibition that he had heard that Erna came to Schuber to live with her father. And then, just after a few days, Erna Hardy had become the hottest topic in the social circle together with the former crown prince and his ex-wife these past days. The rumors about his dear friend that he heard through his friends from the upper class were all maliciously perverted, and she was also known as a snobbish lady who was clueless regarding the marriage business. There seemed to be no reputation more incompatible with Erna than that, considering their friendship for all these years. That was the reason why he suddenly changed his mind and decided to visit her right away. Pavel, who had indirectly encountered the social world during his stay in the capital, already knew what it was like. It was no exaggeration to say that it was a place where reputation could dictate your life, and it could end it as well. Even if the two of them were close friends in Buford, here in the capital, they were undeniably a noblewoman and a painter in the eyes of others. The fact that their relationship can cause a big scandal just by being intimate with each other must have been the reason why Erna didn't announce her connection to him. So, he tried his best to keep in touch with her at the right time, but he never thought that they would suddenly encounter each other at the art exhibition just like that. It was also shocking to learn that, after only a year of not seeing her, the petite-looking country girl had turned into a perfect lady. Pavel. Pavel, who was gazing at the clear summer sky without a single cloud, looked down at the familiar voice he heard from afar. There, he saw the very face that he was looking forward to meeting once again. Erna, with a bright smile on her face, waved her arm excitedly while staring at him. A girl, who was probably a maid, accompanied her. As he watched her approach at a slow pace, he couldn't help laughing out loud at the sight he saw. Where did the perfect lady he had seen on that day go? The Erna in front of him had returned to the country girl that he knew really well. Donning a flowing floral dress, a hat full of ribbons and flower decorations, and even her fresh smile with a bit of shyness, the lady in front of him was undoubtedly the lady of the Baden family, his friend Erna. The two, who were approaching each other, stopped on their tracks at the same time, leaving a gap of about a step between them. In the end, it was Erna who reached out her hand first. Should I call you Mr. Lore today? No. He shook his head and grabbed her extended hand. Today, call me Pavel. My friend Pavel? Staring at her who naughtily asked him again and again, Pavel happily nodded his head. Erna's smiling face was as bright as sunlight and a smile resembling hers suddenly appeared on the corner of his lips as he continued to gaze at her contagious smile. It was the first time after years without seeing each other, he could finally meet his dear friend once again. I think my father wants to marry me off, Erna said. She was walking along the river bank with Pavel, who looked at her sidelong as she spoke. He thinks it's what parents should do, though I have no intention of doing that. Pavel stopped on the track and let out a soft sigh. Erna turned to face him with a look of innocence. 
It was clear to Pavel that Viscount Hardy wanted to marry his daughter he had only got as a bargain for buying the Baden family house. If you looked only a little closely at the behavior of this man, it was pretty clear. Then, why don't you move back to Baden Street? Pavel said. Pavel wanted to tell Erna that Viscount Hardy had no interest in being her father and was looking for a way to get rid of her. He wanted to give her a warning, but didn't know how to say it without hurting her feelings. I want to, but I promised I'd stay in Schuber for another year. Once that is done, of course I will move back to Baden Street. Erna said. I'm sure your father has a different plan. Pavel said. Even so, I may have gotten help from my father, but my only true family is my grandmother. Erna said. Contrary to the soft smile Erna showed on the outside, on the inside, she was steadfast and stubborn. She may look infinitely fragile, but that only hid the deep strength of her will. What am I going to do with this kid? Pavel thought. No matter how much he dwelled on this girl, he could never find a solution. Even if Erna returned to Buford, Viscount Hardy was not going to let her go. He may not want her as a daughter, but that did not mean he was going to let her run off to the other side of the country if it meant he could fetch a high price for selling her to whatever person offered the highest price for her hand. There was nothing he could do right now and it left him feeling utterly powerless. You want to go back to Buford again? Erna asked. Pavel had not been back to Buford in quite some time. He used to go back at least once a month to help his father at the lumber mill. You're constantly going in and out of Baden House. Pavel's father had said. You need to stop. Neither you nor that Erna girl are children anymore, and if you want to take your career as a painter seriously, you need to strike out into the world and stop wasting time in this village. Pavel couldn't believe his father would say something so absurd, but there was concern in his eyes as he smoked his pipe and considered the clouds drifting by. After that rough advice, Pavel did indeed strike out into the world and had not returned to Buford or Baden House since. He was not upset by the advice his father gave, even if it was given in bad taste. Pavel pretty much shared the same thoughts he was young, but he was not stupid. Erna was like a sister to him, but he knew that outsiders would look upon their friendship with suspicion, a lumberjack son and the daughter of a failed aristocrat. Rumors spread like wildfire and so, Pavel decided it was time to put some distance between him and her. To keep that promise to himself, and by extension his father, Pavel had not returned to Buford in over a year. Even the letters between him and Erna had dwindled down to nothing. He thought their friendship had reached its natural end. He never dreamed that he would face Erna again, like this. Erna, if you ever need help, just let me know. Pavel said, avoiding Erna's question. Yes, thank you, Pavel. Erna said. Erna smiled brightly up at Pavel and turned to continue the walk along the bank. The wind buffeted the tassels of her parasol as she went. The flowers and ribbons of her wide-brimmed hat bobbed as she walked. The lace of her loose dress swayed in such a manner that Pavel thought she was a giant flower herself. His pulse skipped a beat without warning and he gasped. He bit down the feeling and buried it deep within himself. He could not allow himself to fall for the girl he considered a sister, if not a close friend. That would be a breach of her trust, of their confidence. Erna turned on him and looked into his eyes with a playful grin. Pavel could feel sweat beginning to form under his arms and his mind swam as he looked deep into those pools of reflected light. Do you think there is a way that I could sell corsages of artificial flowers? Erna said. Pavel was so taken aback by this seemingly random question, he summered and grasped at ideas in his mind that melted away like smoke. Corsages was all he managed. No matter how far the Hardy family had fallen on the social ladder, there is no way anyone introduced to the higher tiers would be able to get away with something as simple as selling corsages. 
there wouldn't be nearly enough profit in it to make any notable difference. Erna simply looked at him with that warming smile, waiting for his response. Pavel suddenly felt like a newborn buck trying to stand for the first time. I, er, I can find out. Pavel nodded his head coolly. It was not difficult to understand what situation the Hardy family would have found themselves in, if not for the small amount of money Erna made selling artificial flowers, so he could understand her desire to branch out and do something more. I once sold paintings to the owner of Solda Department Store. I can ask there. It would be a start, Pavel said, when it was clear that Erna was waiting for a more concrete answer. Department Store? Erna moved the words around her mouth, trying them on for size. Thanks, thank you so much, Pavel, Erna said. Her smile quickly became a laugh. Pavel watched Erna bounce along the path as they continued their walk. Erna was still Erna, even after all this time. The feeling brought a mix of joy and sorrow. Joy at seeing his closest friend happy and sorrow that he had set out to cut ties from the one person he felt happy around. It was Erna. Bjorn had been casually looking out the window of his carriage when he happened to catch sight of the woman. He wasn't very close, but there was no doubt about it. The woman walking over the bridge was undoubtedly Erna Hardy, the sassy little thief who had stolen his trophy. She was with a young man who Bjorn was sure he also knew. The name of him was on the tip of his tongue, but might as well be a complete stranger for all his efforts to try and recall it. It wasn't until the distance between them had closed that the name suddenly sprang to his mind. Pavel Lor. The moment he remembered the name, the carriage passed them by. Bjorn ducked his head away from the window and back into the gloom of the carriage. The image of the woman remained in his mind and her smile, like the river Arbit with the sun beating down upon it and casting scales of light across its surface. She was a naughty little minx that liked to entice lords to her with the promise of betrothal, all the while dating that lowly art academy student. She was indeed worthy to be called the successor of Gladys Hartford. They were definitely dating. Bjorn came to this conclusion. It was a feeling that came with the mourning of all the hapless young nobles that fell for her succubus smile and innocent face. 